Good. Um, so I'm honoured to chair this panel. My name is Riley Walker uh, and I'm over from the Minister of Defence. This represents a, a day out for me um, uh, because the day job is on behalf of CDS and alongside um, a team of um, civilian and military staff, uh, we plan, direct and assure military strategy and operations on a daily basis. So aligning that with the philosophy of the integrated, uh, integrated operating concept and stimulating our operational commanders um, to orchestrate activity across those domains of sea, air, land, space and cyberspace to, in the words uh, of a previous uh, speaker, comprehensively engage those who would wish us ill is uh, my responsibility. So I'd like to extend my thanks and my admiration to the speakers, to the organizers and to the participants. This is a very timely conversation at a personal level, but also professionally. Um, and any prepared words that you hear today uh, are on the record, but obviously questions and answers are not. So the United Kingdom retains strategic advantage by integrating with allies. Uh, so says the Defence Command paper that accompanies the integrated review. Uh, the basis of our defence, uh, deterrence and influence is our willingness and ability to commit hard power to fight wars uh, and is as much about being able to project power to where allies and partners need it. So I think the question really is, how's that all working out for us, uh, particularly in an era of uh, competition uh, and confrontation when our integrated operating concept demands uh, that the military instrument is as useful before the conflict as it is during it. So to discuss this and other perspectives on integrating with allies, I'm joined um, online uh, by Sarah Tarry from NATO, Heather Connolly from the Policy Research Organization Center for Strategic and International Studies, Lieutenant General Michael Cleason, who's the Commander of Joint Operations for the Swedish Armed Forces, and with me here in London is Brigadier Mark Pullen, who serves on the staff in shape. So thank you all and online for joining me. And Sarah, would you like to begin? I would be happy to, and, and thank you very much for, for the introduction. And thank you for this opportunity to exchange views with the other panelists and, uh, and with the audience today. Um, and I think the focus on integration is, is the right one. And I'm, I'm pleased to provide a, a NATO perspective on this because it's also a major direction of travel for, uh, for the Alliance. So I hope that some of the ways that we think about integration might also be useful for the UK as it, uh, as it proceeds with its further conceptual work. So I want to talk today um, about three broad types of integration um, that we look at at NATO. Uh, integration within the military instrument of power integration of this uh, instrument with non-military instruments, and then an integrated approach to resilience, which involves uh, civil military integration. So on the integration of the military instrument, the first point I make, I'd make uh, from a NATO perspective is that we need to ensure that we have very strong and effective linkages between allies' military uh, forces and the NATO command structure. So we have a, a very well-established uh, and robust command structure, but actually very few forces and capabilities that are permanently under its control. So NATO's ability to conduct operations is, is very much dependent on allies' national and multinational forces, as well as their capabilities and headquarters. So one of the key lines of effort is to ensure that allies' forces and capabilities can effectively plug into this NATO framework whenever they're needed. Um, to this end, then training exercises and deployments are with allies um, where everyone's using common standards and enhancing their interoperability remains a really important tool to achieve integration in, in practice. Another really increasingly important form of military integration relates to better using our forces and capabilities in a truly multi-domain approach. So this is about operating across all five domains and then about using the right tools in the right situation. Um, so to achieve this, we need to better operationalize new domains such as space and cyberspace, as well as to look for ways to better utilize emerging and disruptive uh, technologies. And then on top of all of this, we need a command and control system 
that's able to coordinate our responses in real time while preserving decision spaces for, uh, for our leadership. So of course, this isn't easy, uh, given the complexity of the world in which we live and the, the competition uh, that you described, but successful multi-domain integration increases our strategic flexibility and our ability to create um, dilemmas for our potential adversaries. So the second form of integration I, I want to highlight is between the military instrument of power and non-military instruments. And this is essential in order to proactively shape the security environment because many and indeed even most situations require a response that also successfully utilizes non-military instruments. And from a NATO perspective, such instruments generally include joint political statements um, using effective strategic communications, high profile um, visits, as well as diplomatic initiatives. And, and indeed one of NATO's greatest strengths is that it provides a unique platform for allies uh, all 30 allies to coordinate such a wider approach because it's a forum where countries from Europe and North America meet daily to discuss different shared security challenges and to coordinate their actions on a wide range of issues. Um, strengthening this platform even further is uh, one of the key objectives of the upcoming NATO uh, summit in mid-June when NATO leaders will discuss um, a package of initiatives that the Secretary General has developed as part of a forward-looking NATO 2030 um, process. Because we recognize that a message from 30 is always more powerful than a message from any individual ally. And I'd use as an example of this recently, uh, NATO's reaction to the 2014 Revicha ammunition warehouse explosions in the Czech Republic um, following the attribution by the Czech authorities, the North Atlantic Council of Ambassadors quickly consulted on the matter and then released a joint statement expressing solidarity with the Czech Republic and concern over Russia's destabilizing actions. And similarly, earlier today, the Council released a statement on uh, the deviation by Belarus of the civilian airliner um, over the weekend. And then my final theme is about employing an integrated approach to resilience, uh, which requires effective civil military integration. In, in NATO, we like to say that resilience is our first line of defense. And the COVID crisis in particular has made it clear just how essential um, resilience is to our security. And the pandemic was a good reminder of the interdependencies that exist between civil and military the civil and military sectors. In this case, the civil sector needed support from military forces, but our military forces also increasingly rely on civilian services and infrastructure to operate in peace crisis and conflict. And if these services or infrastructure aren't available, our mission success is also at risk. Our potential adversaries, of course, know this, and that's why they use their own military, political and economic tools in an integrated way to undermine and weaken our societies and to target us in ways uh, where we are most vulnerable. And so even though resilience is first and foremost a national responsibility, NATO can't effectively fulfill its mission to deter and defend if allies cannot guarantee at least a minimum standard of, uh, of their own national resilience. And, and this requires a very integrated cross-governmental approach and even more, as COVID has shown, a cross-societal uh, approach. So to conclude, I, I would say um, conceptually, the UK and NATO are both uh, moving towards closer integration um, across the military instrument and between the military instrument and non-military instruments. And from a NATO standpoint, this is very good news because such integration is more likely to succeed at NATO if individual allies have such an integrated approach on a national basis. And I very much welcome the UK's ambition to become allied by design and, and that the effort um, that is now being undertaken in the UK supported, uh, in, including through this conference, is how to operationalize this approach and to ensure integrated operating concept is backed up by concrete actions um, for how to proceed. Um, certainly from a NATO perspective, training, exercising and deploying with allies will be uh, will continue to be key in this regard. 
as well strengthening the linkages between uh, British forces and, uh, and the NATO command structure. And then finally, um, while the military instrument is meant to support other national instruments of power, we need to, rem to remind ourselves that the military instrument itself is increasingly dependent on the civilian sphere. So we also need to approach national resilience in a much more integrated uh, way as well. So that uh, concludes my remarks. I look forward to other presentations and the discussion. Thank you. Sarah, thank you commendably um, on time. Thank you um, very much indeed. And your point about um, seeing what this will look like in terms of operationalizing it is very much what Mark will uh, talk to towards the end. I hope you realize that's what you're going to be talking about. Got it. Um, so thank you very much. And it's a very important year uh, for sort of NATO engagement with defense ministerials and heads of government meeting um, shortly. I was at the uh, pleasure of, of joining CDS at the NATO CHODs meeting that's just happened. And um, when the Secretary General opened with his idea for NATO 2030, I thought that would be a great idea to have NATO in 2030 of itself. Um, but what was more interesting to me was of the 29 chiefs of defense that were in the room there, when I left school and joined the army, 14 of their predecessors would have been in the Warsaw Pact. And I thought, wow, that is a statement of NATO. And that has happened in the time of my career. So I think with that, we will uh, move to the next speaker, which is um, Heather. Um, and we'll now come to you uh, from your perspective. Thank you. Senator Walker, thank you so much. And my great thanks to Rusi for this kind invitation. I've been tasked with uh, sort of describing uh, the challenges of integrating with a critical but a very at times difficult ally of the, the that is of course the United States. Um, and let me begin by sort of helping to shape what the United States wants uh, from this allied by, by design approach. And I will say that these are party perennials. These outlast any Republican or Democratic uh, administration. The U.S. wants to cut defense spending. It has wanted to do this to, to return some of those uh, resources back home. I think you will see this as a goal of the Biden administration. And that's unusual, uh, as we've seen growth in U.S. defense spending far exceeding other NATO allies. Uh, of course, the United States wants to concentrate on the Indo-Pacific. You have seen that uh, conversation uh, avail itself repeatedly. Um, you certainly see where the United States wants to maintain a technological competitive edge. Um, it wants its allies to take on more responsibility uh, in other theaters so that it can concentrate uh, uh, its, its efforts in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and certainly it does want to begin to have the military not be the tool of first resort, but to be the tool of last resort in a broader diplomatic toolkit. So if that's in general what, what the U.S. seeks uh, in, in its conversation with allies, let's turn just for, to, to some reflections about the integrated review, at least from this uh, analyst's perspective. Because for me, what the integrated review told me is that the United Kingdom does recognize, uh, as do many of our NATO allies, that the gap between the U.S. high-end military capabilities and the arrest and the rest of the alliance is now becoming untenable, uh, and that is going to be a, a challenge for uh, multi-domain integration. And that the United Kingdom made a decision uh, to try to to keep pace with the United States on those high-end capabilities. Of course, that comes with, with a great price, uh, but that was a very, I think, a concerted decision. I think the second message in the integrated view was on nuclear capabilities. Uh, and as the United States is preparing for a major strategic stability conversation with Russia, at some uh, hope pulling China into that conversation, the UK's resolve on nuclear capabilities again strengthens, uh, I think, uh, the United Kingdom in a position to help shape that uh, conversation and our reliance on, on one another, certainly as Russia enhances its own uh, strategic uh, capabilities. And so I think that was, again, a very important message 
The third message was the UK's prioritization of the Euro-Atlantic area. As my title suggests, I think a lot about the Arctic, the high north, the strategic command, uh, the commanding heights. Uh, and I think the UK is now uh, taking a much more focused step forward, not only across Northern Europe, uh, but we're also seeing where uh, the Southern flank, the Southeastern flank, the Black Sea, the Eastern Med, this is where uh, the UK is saying the home homeland and homeland defense is important. And I think this is extremely welcome for, for the US that needs greater capabilities uh, in the Euro-Atlantic area. Finally, the, the famous tilt. Uh, while prioritizing the Euro-Atlantic area, the UK was telling us that yes, it has power projection capabilities and most importantly, the political will to use those in the Indo-Pacific, but it cannot sustain itself in the Indo-Pacific. It wants to help the United States, support the United States, but it cannot be there. So I think this is just a resounding message uh, that the US uh, and the UK have a very vibrant uh, future together, but that security and defense relationship together. But that future, of course, uh, restores the centrality of NATO. And I just want to spend just my final minutes talking about the centrality of NATO. And this is certainly where the Biden administration is putting an enormous amount of effort, not only in allied consultation, but in NATO. But I, I think we also uh, have to uh, be very clear-eyed and the United States continues to struggle and confuse consultation with informing allies of a decision that has been reached. And I think that is part of the message that NATO 2030 is providing with political cohesion. Uh, the United States has to rethink its approach to allies. Uh, and this is very difficult for us, but that political cohesion that true consultation, not informing of decision made, will be very, very important. The other critical element of NATO 2030, which again, I think the, the UK uh, with its approach and allied by design is really powerful, is NATO and partners. I call it the transatlanticism plus. This is where NATO working with the Quad members, with Japan, with Australia, with India, we now need a global NATO. Uh, that has this wonderful, rich partnership, how do we use that uh, more, more significantly in, in partners? And then finally, uh, pulling on Sarah's point, um, there has to be greater speed and agility uh, to NATO's response uh, to a variety of hybrid uh, attacks, uh, attribution, quick, unified response. The Belarus example is strong, the Skripal, poisoning case is another where we have to act with speed. And the more fragmented we are around the NATO table, and we are fragmented uh, politically, how can we restore that speed and that agility? And finally, what I think we're going to see NATO do, as I think Northern Europe is a perfect concept of this, the speed and agility comes from those NATO partners that have capabilities that work together for a common focus. So looking at anti-submarine anti warfare uh, in the North Atlantic, the US, the UK, Norway, uh, buying interoperable uh, equipment and providing a clear and important capability to the Alliance. This is how NATO gets speed and agility and helps build that multi-domain uh, integration that will be critical. So with that, I'll turn that back over to you. Thank you. Heather, thank you um, very much indeed. And I think your point about the speed and agility that comes from having worked together with um, allies against common problems is, is absolutely some of the thinking um, that aligns behind the Joint Expeditionary Force. So I am uh, delighted to hand over now to, uh, to Michael, who's uh, calling in from Sweden, um, from his perspective um, as one of those partners. Michael. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rolly, and uh, it's a great privilege, privilege to uh, be able to participate, and uh, I'm impressed by the um, interventions made so far by my, my uh, fellow panellists. Um, happy, of course, also to be able to contribute with a, with a Swedish perspective. Um, I will 
dwell a little bit on, on the Swedish so-called total defense concept. However, being very clear on that, I'm, I'm not pointing my finger at anyone or any, uh, any other organization or anything like that, uh, because we have a lot of lessons to uh, um, both identify and learn in that regard too. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's a concept that I think could shed some light on, on some uh, aspects of how we approach integration uh, uh, on a national and, and regional level. Um, I will also mention a few aspects of, of Nordic Defence Corporation um, and the pragmatism uh, that surrounds it. Um, where do we come from? Well, uh, from the notion during uh, our situation uh, in the years of the Second World War as, as um, a neutral country um, uh, surrounded by occupied countries or uh, conflicting nations uh, and the sheer notion of, of, let's say, the impact of the Second World War in terms of total war. A total war requires a total defense and based on that, uh, conclusions were drawn and, and Sweden started um, in the in the 40s already to build a, a total defense concept that integrated the defense concept between the military assets and and all the civilian agencies. Um, it's um, uh, little known that that Sweden was was probably one of the most militarized countries during the the Cold War, um, the, one of the most militarized countries of, of Europe. Um, but also um, structured and, and, and uh, defense uh, in terms of defense in a way that a completely integrated defense effort between civilian agencies, the government, and of course, military capabilities. Um, the fall of the Berlin Wall and all that is, is history. Uh, you know all the details and we, like everybody else, um, saw the, the era of eternal peace emerge and, and uh, decided to not only downsize the military, um, but also to practically decommission um, our total defense concept. Um, not as a notion and an idea, but, but uh, in, in practical terms. Uh, what has not been fading during that era was the, the notion, um, both in society as a whole, but also in the military, that, um, well, all civilian actors, uh, individuals, as well as companies, as well as, as institutions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are and will remain an integral part of the operational environment, and thus also always present in terms of, of military decision making and military planning and all types of military activity. Uh, obviously, the tide has turned, and uh, like so many other countries and organizations, 2008, 2014, Russian action and, and, and uh, illegal annexation of Crimea, etc., that reversed the whole process. And um, after a strategic review and a defense bill um, emerging from that in 2015, we started to reverse back uh, in terms of homeland defense, national focus, and started to kickstart uh, or began to kickstart the, the rebuilding of the total defense concept uh, with a lot of risks following that, of course. One of the risks, um, for obvious reasons, is, is um, um, uh, that there is a tendency to go back in time and, and try to, to dig up whatever we had during the Cold War and, and restart that. But uh, it, it, it became clear quite, quite early on that this is no longer the way to go. We need a total defense 2.0, uh, reflecting how society has developed, how technology has developed, and what sets the standards for um, uh, integration in modern terms, uh, and, and as well, a total defense. And this is also the reason why I say that I'm not pointing my finger, claiming that we have a perfect concept uh, in, in Sweden in that regard. Uh, quite the opposite. We are in the midst of, of rebuilding and, and, and developing uh, that type of concept, and, and we still have a long way to go. Um, but um, again, the sheer notion and the history uh, makes it a little bit easier because there is a natural um, aspect to it to us uh, in, in, in terms of integrating civilian and, and military efforts. Um, if I look into some of the prerequisites for success uh, in the new setting, and also dealing with the fact that, that we have um, um, a potential opponent uh, or um, 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 an actor that is uh, very much into non-linear and hybrid and gray zone type of activities. Uh, we need to um, uh, accept the fact that we need a, a basic level of own freedom of actions. 
um, we need to outbalance strategic dependencies uh, and have a, um, um, a basic level of, of um, uh, resilience in, in the country as, as such, also reflecting uh, the need for some strategic supplies. Um, pragmatic partnerships um, throughout alignments of, of true joint interests, geostrategic interdependencies, but also lack of alternatives. A lack of alternatives is, is basically one of the reasons why uh, the Nordic cooperation has, has been uh, relatively effectively, uh, effective. Um, forming common ideas and common strategies based on the sheer notion that, well, uh, or realization that we have different uh, security policy solutions. Um, and, and as well known, both Denmark and Norway, full members and founding members of NATO, Sweden and Finland are not. Um, but still, um, based on geostrategic facts, and, and that these geostrategic facts uh, leaves us with little um, uh, or few alternatives um, than to cooperate uh, on, on certain military aspects. That has led to very pragmatic work on, on uh, cross-border training activities with uh, our air forces. We uh, allow um, also uh, armed uh, aircraft to, to land on each other's bases. Uh, we uh, exchange uh, radar information and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also need to form a common strategic culture through the willingness to share information, which is sometimes a very challenging one, not the least between civilian and military actors. Um, this is, of course, uh, in order to, to form and, and, and to, uh, to foster a situational awareness and, and understanding. Um, and this reflects the need uh, that that is directed to society as a whole. Uh, if I look quite internally, um, one of the most important, so some of the most important questions is how, how to make an immigrant in a, in a Swedish suburb understand and accept and support defense, how to make a company, uh, a company CEO, for example, willing to timely refocus production in support of the defense effort. How to get politicians to accept that military capability must be able to use at all levels of conflict, also in gray zone scenarios. These are some aspects that, that we need to address. Um, the traditional Western linear approach uh, towards uh, Russian activity will um, and, and should be met by a non-linear one. Just to give you an example, a military, uh, militarily assertive action could and must be used and uh, met by focused pol um, police operations on, for example, tax fraud. Uh, we need to foster cognitive resistance instead of reflexive control. Uh, and this requires re um, generally um, investment in um, a high level of education in the society as a whole, um, a knowledgeable society. Um, and we also, as was uh, touched upon by, by some of the other panelists, uh, we need to master the fourth industrial revolution uh, in support of uh, a better uh, managed uh, strategic OODA loop, if I may use that term. And um, uh, this requires knowledge, relevant concepts, resources, um, and of course, legal provisions as well. We have to limit the existence um, of and emergence of uh, new exploitable mismatches that equals uh, critical vulnerabilities, both militarily and, and society as a whole. And um, 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 coming to an end, we have to defeat the sheer thought of exploitation, uh, of being exploited, and we have to defeat the plans of our uh, adversaries. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, indeed. And I think um, your uh, is a very instructive. I think the idea of a total defense is, um, is fascinating and it's how one stimulates the conversation with one's own citizens to realize um, that a total defense is needed. And perhaps that's an area we can go in some of um, the questions on this. So. Um, we'll turn now to, to Mark um, in the room, uh, who will, uh, is currently working on some planning within shape, and I think you'll share your insights in the practicalities of how we are going to integrate better with allies. Absolutely, sir. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the introduction. It's great to be here. Uh, you get a day out from the MOD, and I get a day out, uh, two days out of lockdown in Mons. So I think I'm winning, and if you need to take questions or I can stay around tomorrow, please do give me a shout. I'm, uh, I'm available. Um, so... Integration is uh, and will continue to be central to the success uh, of NATO as we navigate the increasingly uh, uncertain global strategic environment that we have talked about today, without doubt. So with this in mind, uh, I would like to build on, on three 
key points that I hope will uh, not only develop the, the theme of this particular session, but generate debate. Uh, and this will all be through uh, the NATO lens and specifically shape headquarters. First, uh, from our perspective, the time is to prepare now. Uh, we can't wait any longer. The global strategic context is uncertain and is going to get worse and certainly more complex. Second, uh, no one uh, can win alone. Success will uh, only come from 10% 10, 10 inspiration and 90% uh, coordination and cooperation with allies and partners. And third and finally, we must sustain and develop credible, ready military capabilities that can survive and win at 360 degrees and when called upon, uh, win across all the domains. So that's, that's what I'm going to cover. So how do we do that? Well, on the back of um, the endorsement of the DDA concept, the, the deterrence and defense of the Euro Atlantic area, in summer of last year, SACA set about a, a really uh, positive and optimistic program of change from a planning perspective. Um, he... Uh, issued in uh, December, well, January of this year, uh, SACA strategic directive, um, uh, a, a directive that was to better organize, cohere, and direct peacetime activity across his area of responsibility, seeking to improve the balance of NATO's output uh, and, and cohere national activity to enhance the deterrence effect again, across his area of responsibility. Then, on the 27th of April, General Radford D. Sacker uh, presented to the military committee the initial Sacker's AOR-wide strategic plan, or the ISASP as it's called. This is the first time in 50 years uh, that the Alliance has had a coherent, top-down, AOR-wide military strategic plan, and I believe uh, offers an inflection point for the Alliance, a way back to re-establishing a culture of strategy. It could be argued that over the recent years, NATO's response to strategic shocks has been to perhaps design, uh, develop and agree a series of uh, boutique solutions to particular military problems. I'd offer that the graduated response plans being the most obvious. Uh, but those I believe to be uh, bottom-up driven solutions at the operational and tactical level. The ISASP uh, and the subordinate planning that will flow from that, um, domain-specific planning, regional planning, all heart putting nations at the heart of planning, marks a departure to a more measured, balanced, strategic approach to crisis and conflict. NATO is absolutely aligning allied command operations, nations and NATO headquarters into that st st military strategic plan, and that's not a quick or easy thing uh, to, to achieve. There are 30 nations, therefore a minimum of 30 compromises that must all be agreed for anything to be actionable or meaningful at the operational and tactical level. But as I said, it is necessary. No one will win alone. As we've heard, there are just too many challenges for one nation to overcome. So alliances, coalition coalitions and partnerships make absolute sense, as we've already heard, more so if they can interact in a common cause. And when faced with the real strategic dilemmas, nations feel stronger and are stronger together, networked with friends and multiple partners bound together by a common interest, common standards and common values. It is this network, our ability to deliver a shared response, that is key to success as we work to reestablish order. And I would see NATO as a core provider of this network, particularly inside of SACA's area of responsibility. But there is, however, a, a lot to do. While NATO drives integration at the strategic level, operational, tactical, practical integration is much harder to achieve. If NATO is to fight and win in a multi-domain context, it must evolve. As, as an example, there are at least 15 variants of main battle tank, 49 types of armoured infantry fighting vehicle, and 56 different variants of armoured support vehicles in the Alliance alone. This doesn't take into account the vehicle types that belong to the other 39 partner nations, nor does it take into account the different natures of ammunition that all need moving to the right place at the right time, 
or the absolutely critical C4I spine that will be relied upon to make our seams and sinews of that alliance uh, deliver strategic dilemmas to a potential adversary across an AOR that covers a third of the globe. It's challenging enough uh, to get endorsement of a five-year equipment plan in the UK. It's even more challenging uh, to knit that together with 30 nations, with 30 compromises, with 30 different aiming points. NATO is working hard to solve these problems. It won't solve them, but point people in the right direction. But it will need focused and prioritised effort from across the alliance to address the multiple interoperability shortfalls that currently exist and have done for some time. Every uh, PXR point I see from a NATO exercise talks about the lack of C4I that's able to command and control over scale and across multiple domains. We must get better. My final point is, is linked uh, and it focuses in on the realisation that to be operationally and tactically effective in support of that top-down military strategic plan, NATO allies and partners must build effective forces that can credibly deter and, if required, defend in crisis and conflict. Given the context, it's important we focus on less conventional areas as well as the more traditional main capability requirements we are so used to. NATO allies and partners will have to align actions across domains, environments and functions and, and, and in time and in space to achieve specific effects against multiple adversaries. Multi-domain 360 degree operations are central to uh, the effective employment of NATO military instrument of power. And the, as the technological blizzard of advancement continues, political processes and the authorities for militaries to act at the speed of relevant, relevance must keep pace. Uh, and uh, as was talked about on the previous panel, in some areas, it is those processes that are actually leading the way. So let me finish where I, I started. Uh, the, the time is now. Uh, NATO is developing new mil military strategic plans that are driving alignment and coherence across NATO allies, linking national and NATO plans. It's happening now. But let's remember, success is best when shared in a deliberate fashion. And none of this will work unless we continue to drive a culture of readiness at the tactical and operational level, building interoperability into our force design so that NATO can respond at the speed of relevance when directed to by our political masters. Thank you.